More heavily driven by high quality data from Chainlink, high quality connectivity across chains from Chainlink CCIP, and high quality computations like automation to make the contracts work. About 80% of those technical problems are reapplicable to the technical problems of banks and bank private chains. Now, all of those different groups I mentioned before, all of the banks, all of the asset managers, the exchange, and in some cases even the central banks, will all have their own chains. In having their own chains, they create a kind of technical fragmentation. This technical fragmentation then creates a fragmentation of liquidity, such that each bank, each asset management firm, each exchange, having its own infrastructure, fragments the liquidity, the purchasing power of its user base, into that infrastructure, but not into a shared infrastructure. And transactions can only happen in a shared infrastructure model. All of these chains, and all of these transactions need a set of standards in order to happen. So in order for you and me to transact, we need a settlement price. Coins and say someone else's chain would have the assets, and you need to do what's called delivery versus payment. You need to finalize the transaction where the assets move to the one chain and the payment moves to the chain where the asset came from. This requires a cross chain connection. Now, to even move those assets, you need additional data like identity data to comply with basic AML, AML KYC and travel rule requirements. So now there's additional data that needs to make its way into the transaction. The, the real way to think about the traditional capital markets is that it's layers upon layers of systems that have resulted in generating a transaction with certain properties. Those properties is that the transaction has a settlement price, the transaction meets identity requirements, the transaction is able to move across certain rails, the transaction is connected to payment systems that can pay for it to happen. And that is what needs to get rebuilt in the blockchain world. In the blockchain world of, of private chains, banks, and asset managers, it is being rebuilt by everyone having their own chain. So as everyone has their own chain, they rebuild parts of the infrastructure for how the system works. And then there's other parts, like the ability to ingest data, the ability to connect those contracts across chains, the ability to be compliant, that needs to be fulfilled by a shared global standard. And that shared global standard is now becoming Chainlink. Chainlink's data, activity solutions across chains. And once everybody is on a same standard, transactions can happen seamlessly. This is what protocols like Swift and Fix and others have done in the traditional world. Those protocols are not able to interface with blockchains. And so the other big part of what we're doing is we're allowing those protocols to interface with blockchains so their large user base can interface with blockchains for any activity, buying, selling, generating assets, moving assets through the Chainlink interface. So that's the general overview of, of what's going on. We're generating an infrastructure that is a global standard for data transmission and value transmission between blockchains and basically creating a set standard under which transactions can happen a set standard for how data can allow a transaction to happen, a set standard with which data is injected into the transaction to inform the real world asset, to allow it to comply with certain requirements, and how that transaction can then interact with the payment network. Now this world is really split up into three key parts. The first part is the asset part. It's the actual asset that's being transacted. This is often called real world assets and whatever assets in the banking world and uh, sometimes it's called both things in the asset management world. And the generation of an asset 
for us is really the creation of what we call a unified golden record. So a unified golden record. A data container is an on-chain data container in the that has both the ownership right and various pieces of data about the underlying asset in one data container. So the way the traditional system works today is the value transfer method, the ability to transfer ownership. For example, if a token has carbon credit, is the carbon credit valid and redeemable or has it been redeemed and therefore invalid? If it's tokenized real estate, does the real estate have any additional debt that's appeared against that asset? If it's money market funds, what is the NAV calculation? What is the valuation of the fund? If it's any other asset, what is the data that can prove the status of the underlying thing, the underlying asset, on a real-time basis? And this is actually one of the basic fundamental problems in financial markets is people have assets that they don't understand. And they're not able or not informed enough or not connected enough to data to understand what's going on with the underlying asset. This creates these big information asymptotes, which lead to things like the 2008 financial crisis. So the asset is you're getting a lot of huge debt like 24-7-365 markets, and you have a federal bank, which is a very valuable asset, and then you have to move some paperwork and you're paying a couple of dollars of their interest on it for that additional three days to be able to do so. That's very valuable. And you get this better risk management solution in the form of a unified global record, not chain record. That's slightly different than what the RWA world is doing in Web3. In Web3, it's tokenizing a bunch of assets that will be valuable collateral for protocols and for users that want to own it in tokenized form. And eventually, the capital markets world and the Web3 world will have to merge into a single world. And in order to do that, they will need to be on a single set of standards, data standards, connectivity standards, and computation standards. So on the asset side, the Web3 world is kind of innovating in assets at the edges, and the capital markets are repackaging hundreds of millions of dollars of capital that they already have. Now, the second component of all this is that you need a payment method in order to transact. And the payment method in the payment sector has to comply with certain legal requirements. That compliance with legal requirements is basically the gating issue to whether or not that payment method will or will not be used. So there's no payment method in the legal requirements that they're going to use. So this is the big thing that's being done right now. The various stable coin providers that want to compound that payment method, the various banks making their own stable coins. There's central banks trying to generate central bank digital currencies to fulfill this role of a payment solution against these assets. Because even if you have an asset, if you have no stable, riskless form of payment, then transactions generally won't happen because people generally don't prefer to do asset-to-asset transactions. They prefer to do, here's the value of the asset. That value is written into a smart contract. I know what it is. Second by second, I don't have to wait a week for a month to value it. And now I can purchase it with a stable, ideally riskless form of payment that's been exposed to various counter-risks, counter-risks, including legal as a risk. That world is now in the process of development and is actively working with the various participants there, stable coins, tokenized cash deposits from banks, private bank money, central bank digital currencies. All those payment solutions are basically fitting into a model where the central bank digital currency, stable coin, or other payment method is purchasing power to interact with that asset in a secure and reliable way. Then it will inject even more data into that asset to allow it to be transferred in a way that complies with various legal conditions so that banks, asset managers, and others can actually purchase the asset and can actually send payment for it. And then after that asset moves onto those other chains, it will need to stay synchronized with data. And then staying synchronized with data, it will retain the property of being a unified golden record, which is once again the key property that we're generating here by merging the dynamics of data and value into a single system such that you don't need to go get data. You don't need to figure out a ton of data if the unified golden record, if the real world asset is properly constructed because the key aspects of the asset's health, quality, risk are all in the ownership receipt that you possess and that anyone else who wants to buy can look at and read. So 
that's the world that we're in the process of building. Right? So the process of building a world where real world assets are generated at reliable and unified world time scales. There's a reliable cross chain connection between hundreds of different chains where the liquidity is unified into a single network. You have very multiple payments, everything from simultaneous payments to money. So you have the issue of paying money, middle brand cash, central bank issue money. All those forms of payment are also on that network. And the value that the assets and the payments can flow across that network in a way that complies with the legal requirements of all the counterparties. But then there will be huge amounts of value, hundreds of trillions of dollars in value in the banking sector and the asset management sector that will only interact with things once it meets those legal requirements. There has to be a system that allows them to do that. Once you have a network of interconnected chains with high quality assets, with high quality payment methods, with high quality data underpinning all of those interactions in a way that's highly reliable and allows people to comply and do transactions in the way that they have to, I think our entire industry reaches a whole new level. The final piece of the puzzle is really the emergence of secondary markets where all of those assets and all of those payments me payment methods eventually find secondary markets. Some of those secondary markets will be on-chain, some of them will be off-chain, some of them will be on-chain in Web3, some of them will be on-chain in the bank chains. The important thing is that all of those secondary markets on all those various chains can also interact with each other over a secure cross-chain connection that is able to move both data and value. And this is one of the key points that I think Chainlink uh, significantly excels at, is there are systems that can provide data and there are systems that can do cross-chain. From what I can tell right now, there are no systems that can allow you to generate an asset with the necessary data on the first chain and to generate it in a way that as the asset moves to other chains, it will continue to receive the critical data on a synchronized basis, right? So as it goes to the second chain or the third chain or the fourth chain or the fifth chain, keeping the asset in sync with the data is actually one of the key components of making this work across the multitude of chains while still having a unified golden record. And in addition to all that, in addition to the ability to provide data to the asset to generate it, the ability to provide more data for it to flow in a way that complies with various legal conditions, the ability to, to have it move across that chains uh, against various payment methods, and the ability for it to stay synchronized with data as it goes from chain A to B to C to D to E, you also have a very big kind of traditional legacy existing infrastructure problem that is not going to go away. And this is where I work with SWIFT and other key foundational financial industry protocols is very important. Because banks, asset managers, exchanges, CSDs, central banks, all these groups are not going to replace their existing infrastructure. What they're going to try to do, and what they're already in the process of doing with us in some cases, is layering blockchain infrastructure on top of their existing infrastructure in a way that it can interface efficiently. So their basic calculus is, how do I efficiently use my existing signing key, my existing database, my existing infrastructure, my existing workflows with blockchains as a transactional mechanism, whether it's on the asset side or the payment side. And this challenge uh, being solved will rapidly accelerate the adoption of legacy existing infrastructure problem that is not going to go away. And this is where I work with SWIFT and other key foundational financial industry protocols is very important. Because banks, asset managers, exchanges, CSDs, central banks, all these groups are not going to replace their existing infrastructure. What they're going to try to do, and what they're already in the process of doing with us in some cases, is layering blockchain infrastructure on top of their existing infrastructure in a way that it can interface efficiently. So, their basic calculus is, how do I efficiently use my existing signing key solution, my existing database, my existing infrastructure, my existing workflows, with blockchains as a transactional mechanism, whether it's on the asset side or the payment side. And this challenge uh, being solved will rapidly accelerate the adoption by thousands of banks. Because the alternative for them is to natively integrate into hundreds of chains, learn hundreds chains that are not stable, that constantly change, that ship breaking changes, which is something I don't think they'll just even be able to do. And they also realize this. 
So the other big thing that's being provided by us in these meetings and these conversations and some of these uh, ongoing implementations is the blockchain abstraction layer within CCIP that allows any off-chain system to interface with hundreds of different chains through a single standard, a, stand a single methodology that leverages their existing signing keys, their existing infrastructure to then affect on-chain events on hundreds of different chains. When you put all this together, what you find is hundreds of thousands of chains with all of the world's value on them, with more advanced smart contracts, like RWAs, Mesa spending protocols, derivatives protocols, secondary market exchange protocols, all of which require larger and larger amounts of data to function, whether that's to do the transaction at all, or whether to comply, or whether to, to do any number of steps. And then you have a need to connect all the thousands of chains into a single internet of contracts, similarly to how TCP IP connected many different technologies, separate technologies into the internet, into the shared global internet that houses both banks and fintechs, startups and largest institutions in the world, they're all on a single internet. So that's really what I, I think we're involved in doing at this point. We, as a community, have done a really great job uh, with Web3, powering the majority of DeFi, powering the most RWA implementations, powering the most And that's a great achievement. That's a great thing that I'm very proud of and very, very grateful to all the people that I have the luxury of working with and pleasure of learning from and, and also the community which, done, which has done a huge, huge amount of effort to get us to this point. So that's a great place that we've gotten. But in getting to that place, we have kind of earned the right, we've earned the position from which we can now become the way the rest of the world operates as it transitions into this new blockchain format. That's the fundamental thing that's really happening, is that every 40, 50 years, you have a reformatting of how all value exists. The last reformatting was from paper into digital, into the internet. And that was a once in a multi-lifetime opportunity. Now, that is happening again. So. Now, after 40, 50 years, all of the world's value is being reformatted into this blockchain format for everything. Real estate, equities, commodities, insurance, gaming, global trade, all of it. Because it's a fundamentally superior way for transactions and peer-to-peer -peer digital relationships to operate that, are, that is guaranteed rather than probabilistic. Right? So it's just a superior format for how value and digital relationships are managed. In the process of this transition, there's a lot of surrounding problems. How does data reach the value? How does the value move across chains? How does all of this stay synchronized with the existing infrastructure of the world? How does the value on the existing infrastructure migrate into this new format? How does all of that interact in more and more advanced ways by proving more and more things about the underlying value to the user in a cryptographically guaranteed manner, justifying the blockchain format as a better and better way to have value and, and manage transactions. These uh, fundamental problems are basically the problems that we now have the opportunity to be the group of people, to be the community that solves these problems. We have gotten to that point through over seven years of uh, very hard work, uh, together with some of the smartest people in the world, some of the best security experts, some of the greatest engineers, and some of the, the, the most committed, thoughtful, helpful, great community members. But now we have this chance to be the way the world works for the next 40 or 50 years as this big transition happens. And that, I think, is the really exciting thing for me. And if that transition happens, I think society gets two very big things. The first thing that it gets is in developed countries, everything works much, much better. Information asymmetry goes away in markets to a large degree because information is in the asset and people can't game the system. Systemic financial booms and busts get smaller because people can make more rational decisions. The whole financial system works better. Everybody has access to more assets. You can buy a fractional piece of a hotel or the restaurant you go to. There's a lot of exciting thing that happens in developed markets 
both for how the system structurally works, for society state, and the new kinds of products and things that become available. And then in emerging markets, we arrive at a world where people go from zero to one, where they didn't have a bank account, they didn't have an ability to buy insurance, they didn't have an ability to participate in the global marketplace through global trade, and now they have all of those things because they don't need to rely on their legal system. They can now rely on the cryptographic guarantees of smart contracts as an alternative system of contracts that is sufficiently easy to use, sufficiently secure, and sufficiently globally connected that they can transact with other people and they can hold value in not a bank account, but a stable coin or a central bank digital currency or a tokenized deposit of some kind. And they can now change their entire economic life as a result of that in ways that people in other countries take for granted. So really, I think what the telecommunications companies and industry did for communication and what the internet did for education and information transfer is what blockchains will do for people's economic future. That is really the thing that over the next 10, 20 years, I think we'll arrive at if all of this is successful. So I'm going to continue meeting with a lot of these ingrained large institutions that have all of this value. I think Chainlink, due to its security and reliability and all of its great features and properties, will continue to be the global standard in Web3. And then if it's the standard in Web3 for how price, data, transactions work, and it's the standard for how price, data, and various uh, transfers and transactions work in the capital markets, we actually arrive at a world where those two worlds Cool.
Thank you for your service. How's it going? Did you get a haircut? Huh? Did you get a haircut? Do I get a haircut? Yeah. Yeah. It looks fresh, bro. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. How's it going? Good. You too, bro.
is this good for Bitcoin? Is this bad for Bitcoin? There's, there's very colorful conversations about um, protocol proposals, uh, about uh, software proposals, about developer initiatives, about applications. The latest is, you know, all the debate around ordinals, inscriptions, BRC20 tokens, but you've always got covenants and tribe chains and and uh you know if we look back right the uh probably the most formative period in the history of bitcoin was the block size wars and uh that really did um it, it did define uh the network and define bitcoin uh in a very strong fashion but I, I think that if we look forward another decade or two or three, and certainly over the course of 100 years, there are going to be more and more of these issues that will pop up. There'll be more constituents that will get involved in the discussion. And um, I, I don't really think uh, having a debate in 240 characters or less on Twitter is terribly constructive for, you know, a, a, a topic which requires a lot of nuance and subtlety and um i also i also think that it's important to be principles based in the way we discuss these things i think if we all focus upon what are our assumptions what are our principles then i think there'll be less confrontational uh and less combative and more constructive right in the community so I thought it'd be useful to have kind of a constructive dialogue about Bitcoin philosophy, Bitcoin principles, frameworks of analysis. Uh, so there's a basis for whatever comes next. Right. And as you point out, I think the block size wars of 2015, 16, 17 was sort of a, a battle for the soul of Bitcoin. And maybe some people have discussed about, you know, what really is Bitcoin? What are we, what are we doing here? and you know what kind of changes are acceptable and i guess I disagree on what kinds of you know changes yep, yep. there like as an example like some people might say uh it proved that the block size should never increase and other people might say no actually it's more like not now not in this way and maybe in the future you know and, and that's just one example on the block size so let's talk a little bit i think we'll, we'll bring it to this idea of you know bitcoin as a protocol and so do you want to just spell out some of your thoughts there like what if we're thinking about the bitcoin protocol and what are the pieces of that that should remain, right? What are those fundamental pieces that must remain? Yeah, I mean, I, I would hate for someone to define me based upon one tweet response on one issue or or six response on six issues. I think that uh, I think that when we all start to understand each other's principles and philosophies and how we, how we think about these things, I think it lays the framework for us to come to agreement or at least a constructive, cheerful consensus. So, you know, starting with the basic on Bitcoin, and this is my, this is how I view it, right? Everybody has the ability and has the right to view Bitcoin through their own lens and they have their own, uh, their own view of what is it, what is it for and why are they attracted to it? So, so I, you know, I'm not here to tell everybody else, you know, what to think. I'm here just to articulate one view of Bitcoin that I have that I've formed over the course of my life. So I'd, I'd start with this observation. I'd say Bitcoin, it's an asset circulating on a network governed by a protocol based on or rooted in an ideology. And it, it provides humanity with a rational scientifically sound economic foundation for the first time so that that's what bitcoin means to me right it, it is a rational foundation for economics for the human race and um you know bitcoin with a small b is the asset and we've created a digital asset and we did it with protocol and uh, the asset's no value. It is of no value unless there's a network for it to circulate on. So when I, when I think about the protocol, this is the way I look at it. I think Bitcoin, uh, it has three core protocols that are critical to the entire system working. The first protocol is a monetary protocol. The second protocol is a transaction protocol. 
And the third protocol is what, I'll, what I'm going to call a power protocol. It's, it's sort of, it's near-term, real-time security. It's not security of the network over 100 years, but it's security over the network over 100 days or 100 minutes. It's, it's the here and now. So that's based on power. Who has the power over the network? So when I think about Bitcoin in general, well, there's lots of Bitcoin nodes and Bitcoin applications out there. Anybody can create a version of Bitcoin that runs on an iPhone, an Android phone, it runs on Linux, it runs on a different type of computer, et cetera. For them to be part of the network, they kind of have to share these three protocols. They're going to differ in lots of other functions, right? There are other aspects of software. For example, uh, compatibility. Is it compatible with this version of Unix? Uh, there's usability, right? Does it does it run on the iOS? And does it support like uh, you know touch or not? You know, there's compliance. Uh, the version of of, of uh, a Bitcoin wallet that runs in the United States, you know, by a publicly traded company, you know, will have KYC AML restrictions for the state of New York, which will be dictated by New York. And by the U.S., so there's 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 differences in the software that have to do with compliance. Uh, there's going to be security differences, and these this is cyber security. Um, so there will be lots of Bitcoin uh, nodes, and they will all be different in different countries and different jurisdictions for different platforms. But the thing they all is pretty much pristine. Since, you know, supposed you to find it. The transaction protocol, you know, jerked a little bit or, or, or adjusted with Segwit. And uh, Taproot sort of adjusted because they, they changed the theoretical bandwidth and the theoretical nature of transactions. What kind of transactions will the network process and how much bandwidth can it process? The third protocol is the power protocol. And in this particular case, it's not electrical power, it's computing power, but, uh, but what kind of computer power? Digital power. You can define all sorts of power protocols to control a network. For example, democracy is a protocol. One person, one vote. You know? Aristocracy, one rich family, one vote. Yeah. Violence, one gun, one bullet, one vote. Right? The world is full of power protocols. That, you know, the, the deer with the antlers have their power protocol. Um, the power protocol for the Bitcoin network is SHA-256 hashing, right? Uh, and um, it could have been any other, right? It could be a proof of stake protocol. It could be all sorts of all sorts of other interesting power protocols. But the question is, who at the end of the day gets to create the block every 10 minutes? And what kind of power do they have to project in order to create the block? And you know, if I, if I had an algorithm which was a CPU-friendly algorithm, right? It's a, a non-GPU, a non-ASIC-friendly CPU. Well, then, um, then you're allowing any general-purpose computer to participate and generate that computing power. If you had an algorithm that didn't include computing power at all, it's just electricity. But of course, electricity isn't terribly scarce. And computing power isn't terribly scarce. So the idea of SHA-256 hashing creates a very unique digital power protocol. It's something where you can create custom silicon. So you have custom ASICs that are generating lots of SHA-256 hashes. And now we're, we just crossed 500 exahash. That's a lot of power. But what's, what's really critical, I think, about the, the power protocol is that it allows you to construct a silicon machine with a massive mechanical advantage. Like a, a, a custom ASIC, custom silicon gives you a, a 1,000x or 2,000x advantage over a general purpose CPU. And what that means is that what we have here is that three interacting protocols which create four types of scarcity. The first level of scarcity is asset scarcity. The second level of scarcity is bandwidth scarcity. There's a third type of scarcity, which is power scarcity. SHA-256 hashes are a very scarce form of power, right? They, and they can only be cre created by Bitcoin mining equipment. And so there's a fourth type of scarcity, which is technical 
scarcity, technology scarcity, the the ability to design, you know, a high performance semiconductor chip that does SHA-256 hashing, right? What Bitmain has as as a core competency, right? If you can create that, so. In order to guarantee the asset scarcity, you have to have bandwidth scarcity. And in order to guarantee the bandwidth scarcity, you have to have power scarcity. And in order to guarantee the power scarcity, you need technology scarcity. And so you're really looking at like four harmonics or, or you know, four uh, types of scarcity. And they come together and they create a, a they create a network that has integrity and efficiency, right? I need I need the efficiency. Like, like what's efficient? Uh, here's an efficient power protocol. I have a gun. I'm in a room with a hundred other people. One person with a gun that costs three hundred dollars has the ability to secure a billion dollars in a room of a hundred other people. It's a very efficient way to secure the money, right? Whoever has the gun, the gun. Now now take away the gun put the billion dollars in the middle of the room, and now your new power protocol is your fist. <laughs> now you, you can imagine, now you've got 20 people punching 30 other people, right? <laughs> now now the, the outcome becomes very ineffective. Uh, another power protocol is, I'm gonna secure the billion dollars with a hundred million dollars of staked money. You can see that the issue with that is that in a staked economy, I have to actually allocate 10 or 20% of the capital to the to protect the rest of the capital, that doesn't scale very well. So when you actually get to the point where you're creating machines, whether it's a construction crane or whether it's a gun or whether it's a semiconductor chip, you have you have inserted know-how in order to channel energy, in order to actually uh, mm-hmm. exert power. And when I talk about you know scarcity of power, well, the Bitcoin miners own all the SHA-256 ASIC chips. So, you know, on any given day, if every power company or electricity company in the world wakes up and decides to attack the Bitcoin network, they can't really do it because the computing power, the digital power is scarce and they don't have it. If any government wants to attack the network, they can't do it because they don't have the power. The, the actual silicon machine is in the hands of the network operators. So that creates a certain type of efficiency and stability, and you can't really build a civilization without it. I mean, it's, it's the same kind of efficiency you get when you build a dam, right? You, you dam a lake, and all of a sudden you're generating hydropower. Uh, or the same efficiency you get when you have a construction crane and a 150-pound person can lift 20 tons in air, 1,000 feet, right? It's, it's clear you're not going to do it without having a machine. So... I look at the entire network, and I think it's it's a pretty beautiful set of uh, integrated protocols, um, because the power protocol protects the the transactions every ten minutes, and the transactional protocol is a, is a market driven protocol where people are bidding to put their transactions into the block space. So as as the the ecosystem grows, the bid for transactions grows, and a in a classic market economy fashion um and what you have is austrian economics dictating which transactions will get implemented based upon subjective value of all the participants in the ecosystem the miners over the course of a thousand years it's quite obvious right paid by transactions were a bootstrap or an initial subsidy in the first 20 years of the network but as far as I can see, by the year 2035, the block rewards just look de minimis. One.
Sartı sorun. Sartı sorun.